St. Alaska Heritage Institute in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, my name is Chuck Smythe, and I'm the senior ethnologist here. And we are really happy today to finally have a presentation by Dr. Todd O'Hara, long awaited after a couple of months we had to postpone it due to uh, inability to get to Juneau when it was originally scheduled. Um, his lecture is entitled, Coastal Community One Health, Mercury and Subsistence Foods. Dr. O'Hara holds a DVM and a PhD in pharma pharmacology and toxicology. He started his career as a research, bar research biologist in Barrow for the North Slope Borough, and for 15 years was professor of veterinary pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. He then joined Texas A&M University as professor and department head in the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. His major interests are environmental, wildlife toxicology, zoonotic diseases, food security, and wildlife conservation and medicine in a one health context, including assessment of mercury exposure in people of Mexico and Alaska. Working closely with indigenous communities, Dr. O'Hara has done extensive studies on nutrients and contaminants of marine diets, fish, wildlife, and humans, including through chemical analyses of air. Are we set, Dr. O'Hara? Yes, yes we are set. Thank you. I really appreciate your introduction. Yeah, we're very sorry. An ash cloud um, from a Russian volcano. I don't know if you guys remember that back in the spring. Yeah, I, I don't want to say I got stuck in Sitka because you're going to get stuck somewhere. Sitka's okay. So we, we couldn't get over here for the presentation, so apologize for that. So I'm in Alaska again because we have a variety of projects underway. I'm not going to review all those, um, but we'll walk through this and I'll give examples of what we're doing in Alaska and what we learned from what we did in Mexico and in Central California. And it's One Health because I'm gonna to talk to you about pinnipeds, which are seals, sea lions, and walrus, and uh, work we've done in, in research we call it human subjects, it sounds horrible. Uh, but uh, work we've done with people, I think that sounds nicer. Uh, so this is uh, meant to review what we've done, but also to inspire people in Southeast Alaska for future work. And right now, we're working with people in Sitka to write a National Institutes of Health proposal. And I think Mike Miller from Sitka was one, the one who said, you need to talk to SHI. And I said, you bet, that would be wonderful. So I thank the people uh, in Sitka who put us in touch with SHI and um, look forward to seeing what your, your feedback is. And I'm getting feedback. Do I need to turn this off? Are, are we doing okay on the? Okay, I just want to. I was hearing feedback. So, so what I'd like to point out is is that, um, as Chuck mentioned, I started in Barrow or Utkiavik. It's Barrow to me because it was Barrow when I was there, and we kept using the word Barrow <laughs> when Chuck and I were talking. Uh, Utkiavik is where I got started in Alaska and my wife and I moved down to Fairbanks to join UAF and she said we're not moving any further south. Um, she's still in Fairbanks. Our home is still in Fairbanks so we're sticking with that. Uh, but we started working up and down the west coast of North America because we're all linked through the ocean and that's something I think is really important to appreciate is how many communities, whether they're 3 million people or 2,000 people, rely on the oceans. And if you think about following this coast all the way down, uh, there's many, many people, many, many cultures reliant on the ocean. So that's why I put up some of our critters from up here and then some of the critters down in Mexico. And we've done a lot of work in Baja California, sir. One Health um, is what we're going to emphasize initially, is how we tie the health of the environment 
people and animals together. And then dietary pathways of mercury is a big part of what we're trying to understand uh, because it's just not everything in the food web or in our diets has the same amount of mercury in it. And so the state of Alaska is trying to be very careful in how it gives consumption advice because many, many fish species are perfectly safe to eat. So we don't want people misinterpreting that it's fish in general. It's, very, it's usually very specific fish. So we're trying to figure out dietary pathways. When I say fish consumers, I also mean those animals out in the ocean. They're fish consumers too. So we talk about people and uh, other fish consumers, whether they're fish, marine mammals, seabirds. I'm going to review some studies where we looked at adverse effects of mercury in seals and sea lions. Uh, this again is to tie in the One Health idea that we use biomedical approaches to better understand if this is having an adverse effect on any of the wildlife we depend on. So there's conservation reasons and there's uh, food security reasons for addressing these wildlife species. So marine diets and chemical analysis of hair, that will be predominantly for the work we do in people, but we also do it in uh, other mammals. We rely on hair a lot for evaluating mercury exposure. Then I'm gonna bring in some examples from the Arctic where striking a balance is a key part of our work. You need to think about nutrients and the benefits of nutrients, not just contaminants. I've been preaching this ever since I did this work in Kotzebue is we need to be contemplating the foods that are prepared for consumption. If you rely on biologists and ecologists, they're gonna study the animal, and maybe it's tissues people don't even eat, or it's tissues that haven't even been processed for food. That, it, that could be irrelevant. And so I'm trying to encourage, I'll give you an example of that, where we need to rely on maybe sampling what people are actually eating. The other thing is, I often hear people say, well, I'm gonna avoid my subsistence food and buy all my food from the store. Well, that could be a huge mistake <laughs> because store-bought foods have different chemicals in them and they're also contaminated. And I'll give you an example of what we did in Barrow there. And then subsistence foods not currently covered by the state of Alaska or federal government for consumption guidelines include marine mammals seabirds, other, other organisms that people rely on. It's strictly for fish, and so we're missing a lot, both on the nutrients and the contaminants because of the focus on fish. All right, let's rock. So again, one health. So health of coastal humans is intimately tied to the marine environment. People here know that. And then marine animals uh, are resources for humans but they also can tell us about the marine environment. And so we like to use the word sentinels, the canary in the, in the coal mine. They can tell us what's going on in the ecosystem because of the way they integrate everything from the ecosystem as predators. And so uh, a, f a famous scientist at UAF once said, the bowhead whale is the best graduate student you could ever have because it samples the entire Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. Does that make sense? I appreciated that since I studied bowhead whales. I was like, yeah, they are pretty good grad students. They just don't write very well. Um, so we need things that integrate. So mercury in the environment, often this is what people think. Well, it's also this. So the point is that the word we like to use, anthropogenic, or what comes from human activities, but there's also many natural sources of mercury in the environment. So that's why I put this slide up there to remind me to say, yes, human activities, and yes, natural, and HG is the symbol for mercury. So when mercury gets in the environment, is I, I've been to Juno before, and a mine company sponsored these workshops where uh, there, there were people who had environmental concerns that I had to really emphasize this with, is that what goes into the water, what goes into the system, doesn't go directly into our food sources. 
Does that make sense? Because these two processes are going on. And that's why I want to spend some time on it, because this is what drives the concentrations that ultimately end up in the things we eat from the ocean, unless you're drinking the seawater. Well, sea Do you see what I'm getting at? So the first one is bioaccumulation. The contaminant levels get greater and greater as the fish becomes larger and because it's older. We call that bioaccumulation. So some chemicals just aren't eliminated or not eliminated fast enough, and so they build up in the animal over time. And so as they get older, they bioaccumulate. So I think we all know from fisheries research that's been going on, we now are finding out there's fish that live, what, 100, 200 years old, right? Amazing. That's, that's a great opportunity for bioaccumulation. So that's age-related. The next one, there's nothing like the polar bear to exemplify biomagnification. So you start with these invertebrates here, shrimp. So what this is, is the food web. So predators are going to magnify their concentrations because they're eating animals that are predators of predators. So when you have a predator of a predator of a predator, see what I'm getting at? The, the concentrations increase. Polar bears live a long time. So now you can see bioaccumulation and biomagnification could drive concentrations up in things like polar bears, male stellar sea lions, killer whales. And so it's really important to recognize these are occurring at the same time and both drive concentrations up. We've been studying these processes around Alaska to see what's most important in what people are being exposed to. So hopefully this makes some sense and that this is what drives concentrations of mercury in our food sources, not necessarily what goes into the environment. I love this picture. I gave this talk, or this showed this slide in Texas A&M, and one of my faculty members in my department started laughing because he owns this Fiat. <laughs> he didn't realize that an adult male would crush his Fiat. So this is to show you that some of the animals we're dealing with are very proud and stoic, the male stellar sea lion, but also are very large. And we call this sexual dimorphism. They're, they're, the biology is very different between the male and female stellar sea lion just based on size. And so we have to take all these things into account when we study these guys. And of course, this is on some rookery. If you've ever been to a stellar sea lion rookie, you, you, it's not the most pleasant place to be. They, they have some serious personal hygiene issues. <laughs> and they raise pups in that. So we were doing our studies and we were doing our monitoring. Remember, it's a sentinel, sentinel species. We were doing our monitoring and uh, we became across something that really surprised us. And very high concentrations of mercury out here now, I think most of you know that probably not anthropogenic is obvious, right? It's, it's, it's not like there's industry right out there, but there are volcanoes, right? So it became very interesting as to why this was such a hot spot for mercury in stellar sea lions. And we'll circle back to why this is important to commercial fishing. <laughs> so large body size, long lived, so this makes them a good sentinel for us. So the federal government, and somewhat the state of Alaska, was very concerned. If you've followed the stellar sea lion story at all, this is also the area over the past three decades that's been a serious conservation issue for stellar sea lions. The populations continue to decline, whereas here they're going up, here they're steady. So obviously the federal agency was asking, is mercury possibly involved with the decline of stellar sea lions or blocking the recovery of the stellar sea lion population? So they called us in. And so to tie it in with One Health, I think you know, stellar sea lions eat fish that people eat. So boom, One Health. 
the Sentinel turned into a One Health issue and a human health issue because is the mercury coming through the fish? Sure is kind of obvious that it probably is because that's what they eat. So conservation concerns. So this elevated this even more than just a hot spot for mercury. A little bit of biology, a little bit of motherhood. So we can take advantage of in utero means in, in the uterus or during gestation. Um, keratinized tissues, fun, fancy word for hair and whiskers. Hair and whiskers are grown in these. And so when people ask, I'm like, well, here's obvious evidence, right? OK, it's coming out with hair and whiskers. You, everybody understand, see what's happening here? Is this parturition, delivery? <laughs> so if anybody asks, it's like, well, there it is. So the value of this is mom eats fish. Mercury is well known to cross the placenta and get into the fetus. And so we can sample the pups and learn about mom's diet and learn about exposure of the pups to mercury. Why is that so important? In utero exposure, that is in, during gestation, during pregnancy, is the period that we're most concerned about mercury because it affects neurodevelopment and other systems. So we call it the cohort of concern. The fetus and the neonate are where we're most concerned about mercury exposure. That's due to mom's diet. So I coined this term pup power because of these two things, but also statistical power. If you think back to that picture of the rookery, when we go to capture an adult or a juvenile to sample it, where do all the adults and juveniles go when you grab that one? They're in the ocean, they're in the water. Well, that's it for that day. Well, with the pups, they don't go in the water. So we corral them all up, and statistically, we can sample the rookery with a high number of pups without hurting them. So that's where power comes from. It's because we can do a better job with our study designs, as well as they are the life phase we're most concerned about. Hopefully that all makes sense. That's why we focus on the pups. It's not because we're mean. It's because they're the most important part when we look at things like this. Here's why we were concerned. Here's the thresholds of current CERN in wildlife. We've published on this many times now, uh, our group. It's 20 and 30 parts per million in hair. And so we've established that, that that's our, we'd like to be below that. Here you go, your southeast. So you can see in a lot of regions, well below 20, extremely much lower than 30. But then we hit this spot out here and it shoots up. And so this is that hot spot of mercury. And then when we get over to Russia in the far east, it drops back down. So it's not a continuation across the Aleutians. And so this has become our focus, but we always need reference. So um, I'm hoping, and so are my colleagues, that we can increase our efforts down here to get a better handle on what might be going on down here. And I'll show you some more data on that later. Adverse effects, this is actually a an image, I think, from near Sitka. They eat the whole fish. That's what I try to tell people. We study the fillets for the state of Alaska for human consumption. We got to remember, they don't fillet their fish. So we got to remember, their exposure pathway is a little different than ours. Now, we might eat livers on occasion. We might eat the muscle on occasion. But we also cook and prepare it differently. They don't. So this is the difference when it comes to this one health idea is that they eat the fish very differently. I cannot believe he got <laughs> just, Anyway, I, I think that drives home my point. And this poor gull, right, he's waiting for a scraps. I don't think that's going to happen. So what about studying the immune system? And uh, so here's the toxicant being exposed. And 
We study the immune system because it can increase susceptibility to disease if it's, um, the immune system is impacted. This leads to diseased individuals and poor body condition. This can lead to disease outbreaks, poor fetal and neonatal survival. I already emphasized that for mercury. Population impacts. I, I hate to, I know I'm a veterinarian, it sounds awful. I'm not too concerned about the individual animal. This is about population level impacts. So I don't want you to think I have the perspective of an individual animal here. Does that make sense? If it's someone's pet, yeah, maybe. Don't bring your pets to me, please. It won't work. Um, so this is, veterinarians often think like epidemiologists, population impacts. So that's, that's where we're at from the perspective of our studies. But in order to get there, you got to go through these steps. Endocrine disruption, that's hormones and things like that. We won't cover that here, but that's also important. Just wanted to lay that out for you. So what, what did we then do when we went into the literature? Well, I wrote a chapter on mercury and immunotoxicity because it was becoming quite apparent that others were finding this as a problem. These are authors from Europe. They found the immune system as, was a target. They called it severe, I put it in quotes because I didn't think it was severe. Severe immunotoxic effects. Also people from Europe. Some Canadians showed heavy metals modulate marine mammal immune system. And then another Canadian showed that two arms of the immune system may be altered by heavy metals. So, we had evidence that we should explore this. That's what I'm saying, is it to be a good scientist, you do your literature review, and you, then you design your study. So you're not repeating a study, but also it helps you with your study design. So I won't belabor that, but the results from those studies were blood mercury was associated with blood cell counts or hematology. I'm assuming most people in the room have had hematology done, where they look at the blood cells and tell you how your health status is. That's what we did with these celciline pups, and we noticed mercury was changing blood cell counts. That was interesting, we didn't expect that. There's also a uh, haptoglobin, it's a acute phase protein, don't worry about that. It's involved with uh, inflammation, and we saw that increased mercury concentrations were associated with decrease in haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is somewhat protective, and so this is not a good thing. And so we see a couple of immune things here, and these are samples from whole animals, the, the intact animal, taken when they're alive, obviously. However, we found that we were having problems because the Aleutian Islands make the stellar sea lions appear very differently because it's a huge area. They have different prey, they have different, um, infectious diseases going on. So we found that the region was making the study design very difficult. So not to get into too much science here, in vitro is outside their normal biological context. In other words, test tube experiments. So we're gonna take samples from animals and test them in the lab to see how they respond to mercury. In vivo is what I just went over, like when we get the pup, take the hair or the blood, that's in vivo. We've sampled from the whole animal. I just want you to know how evolved our science has become. Um, and our graduate students have excelled in progressive techniques to study wildlife. All the way out in the Western Aleutians, I want you to think about that, from a ship, we've been able to do these studies with NOAA. So how does this work? Here's your victim, I guess. Uh, you get the blood sample, but we're not gonna analyze the blood sample. We're gonna take the white blood cells from it, and we're gonna separate them out, and we're gonna put them on a, this is supposed to be the test tube. This is where the cells are gonna go. We're gonna have varying concentrations of mercury. And one of the things we're gonna look at is how do these cells multiply? It's called blastogenesis. And also how the cells release their chemicals. COVID-19 has, has created a great education for people about 
cytokine storms? Yes? That's what these are. These are cytokines. So they're very important in inflammation. So we did these in vitro studies to see if the cells respond to the presence of mercury. This really helps us because it takes away all those other factors I mentioned. So statistically significant effect in the lymphocytes. This is a type of blood cell. However, this does not mean outright adverse effects to the individuals. It just shows us the immune system responds. We're not testing the individual as to whether it's vulnerable to like an infectious disease. But it tells us the mercury is altering the lymphocytes. Four of those cytokines showed a significant decrease with higher mercury. Again, it does not show the effect of individuals, but scientifically we show the immune system responds to these different concentrations of mercury. And these were relevant concentrations of mercury. This was actually a very important step scientifically. For the public, it's hard to digest. But this justifies our concern and our continued studies that we show the immune system responds to mercury. Breath. How am I doing on time, Chuck? Good. All right. Excellent. So, OK, shift gears. Harbor Seals of Central California. What? Yes. You'll, you'll see. So we have some very good colleagues who study stranded harbor seal pups in a rehabilitation facility. We really don't have that here in Alaska, and frankly, we don't need it. But this was very important because we could sample hair and blood, assess their mercury exposure, and we could measure severe and subtle health outcomes in dozens of harbor seal pups per year. They get dozens of harbor seal pups admitted to their rehabilitation center. And they're professional veterinarians and veterinary technicians that take care of these animals. So we can be very demanding on what we ask from them. Maybe some people know, but San Francisco Bay is well known for mercury contamination. Gold and mercury mining has contaminated that bay to a very extensive level. It's very unfortunate. So in this case, we know the source of mercury. And these concentrations here are the similar dose response as for stellar sea lions. These are the same concentrations we're seeing in the western Aleutian Islands. Wow, what a great opportunity, right? They're same exposure to mercury. And we have them in a facility where we can study them with professional veterinarians and professional veterinary technicians. So we're going to take advantage of this. The first study, again, was exploratory. Dr. Van Humesen, I advised her on this study. And she found associations of mercury with neurological problems. That surprised me. I was like, hmm, with all the background diseases and stressors on these harbor seal pups, she could see that mercury was playing a role in their neurological problems. So with a board certified veterinary neurologist, I know that sounds cool, but she was at UAF. Dr. Chris Thompson, we developed a harbor seal specific neurological exam. So we then said we need to have something very specific for harbor seal pups to look at these subtle effects in these animals. Dr. Mariana Leon, graduate student in our lab, who is now at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She just got an assistant professor job there. I'm very proud of her. She did this study. And she did a multi-year study with much greater sample size of harbor seal pups. She documented adverse effects related to mercury exposure. The question is, are they reversible? So increasing total mercury concentrations in wild-born harbor seal pups, remember, the exposure occurred, the assessment of exposure occurred in the wild via mom, right? Remember, gestation. Transplacental. We saw a decreased response to tactile stimulation, decreased movement, and they stayed in rehabilitation longer. These are very similar to what we've seen in other animals with respect to mercury. Remember I said these could be reversible. So just keep that in mind. 
So that was very important in linking our concentrations of verbs and stout sea lion pups with something we saw in another related animal, the harbor seal. So two pinniped populations it appears the concentrations that we're using for criteria for safe and not safe are, are appropriate. Again, we showed in vivo and in vitro indicate likely responses to mercury. I didn't say adverse effects, I just said responses. Please recognize that. Repeated neurological exams seems to have value, especially in a harbor seal pup where you're in a rehabilitation center and you can do the exams repeatedly. And of course, conservation concerns remain. NOAA is still very concerned about what's happening in the western Aleutian Islands and does mercury have a role along with some other factors. All right. So we're going to switch to people. High mercury concentrations were noted in fish. Our sentinels in this region of Baja Peninsula, California Peninsula, Baja California Sur is a state in Mexico. Capital is La Paz. This is where we based our work out of. And we studied a variety of animals uh, in this region. Once we saw these high mercury concentrations, we realized we probably should be looking at a one health approach to look at people. I'm not going to share all the fish data with you, and we continue to work on fish with them. Actually, in about a week, they're going to be at my lab in Texas A&M running more samples. So we continue to work with them on this issue. So just like the pinnipeds, we studied pregnant women in Mexico. Um, human marine mammals, when you look at their chemistry, they look like any marine mammal. And so very reliant on uh, ocean resources. And so that's this carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes. I'll come back to that a little bit. That's how we look at diet markers. We can look at what people and animals are eating. Um, don't need to understand the chemistry of that. But we assess total mercury concentrations in pregnant women. That's their hair. And then we looked at the marine diet and the influence on mercury concentrations in pregnant women. And so this was work based at UAF when I was there, working with colleagues in La Paz. Critical values tend to be 1 to 10 micrograms per gram in hair. This is the range of concern above 10. They would be concerned, less than one, no concern. So the average was above one, and then the highest one was 90. So the medical epidemiologist we were working with down there wanted to do some follow-up work. But I want to emphasize the studies in Alaska, they are not showing this upper range of concentrations, and our averages in Alaska are much lower than this. I'm not using this as an example of that it's equivalent exposure. I'm introducing you to the tools we're going to use in Alaska to assess human exposure. Hopefully that point's been made that we're, we're not doing this because we think we have similar exposures in Alaska. They eat a lot of sharks in Baja. I think that might be what's driving a lot of this up. So getting back to these diet markers, we call it feeding ecology in animals. In people, we have to say diet markers. But it's feeding ecology in people, too, just a little different way of harvesting. So these nitrogen stable isotope values tell us where one feeds on the food web. That's real important in our assessment. We call that increased trophic level when we have higher N15 values. They're feeding higher on the food web. Think about a vegan versus someone who eats halibut every day. They're going to be very different on the food web, aren't they? So and we actually saw that in one of the communities we studied in Alaska. Vegans and vegetarians were down here, and the fish eaters were up here. So the diet scenario is playing out in Alaska, too. So we're, we're seeing the same kind of relationship we saw in Mexico. But again, I'm going to emphasize this probably three or four times. It's a, it's a black hole. It's a data gap. The fish are being studied in this context, but we're kind of missing the boat for subsistence users 
who rely on these too. And so uh, that's why we did the study. I'll be bringing it up a little bit later. So how do we look at this? So remember, this is Mexico. Here's the stable isotopes of nitrogen. This tells us the diet marker. Here is the survey we did for consumption of fish. As one would expect, as one eats more fish, this marker goes up. Also, the mercury concentrations go up. Sorry, I got it backwards, sorry. Mercury concentrations go up. And the stable isotopes of nitrogen go up. So then we put the one part per million for hair from the EPA in the state of Alaska, five part per million on this plot. And we can see that pretty quickly the mercury concentrations are getting above a level of concern and approaching another level of concern. So this is the kind of studies we're going to be doing in Alaska. We've done it in two communities already. We're being asked to do it in another community up in the Arctic. Northwest Arctic. And so this tells us about exposure and what's driving exposure. So we have details of the fish people are consuming in these communities. So with an epidemiologist, we can start to sort out what actual fish might be responsible for driving mercury. So pathways of mercury exposure are not always obvious. Exposure pathways better understood if we use diet markers. I hate to say it, but diet surveys are unreliable. What I like to say is chemistry doesn't lie. People have a hard time recalling what they eat. I know I do. If my wife's interviewing me, I'm going to say what? Well, of course I didn't eat pizza or potato chips, or right? So it's very difficult to have a diet survey be accurate compared to the, some of the diet markers we have available to us. Mercury is concerned for many fish consumers. Now it's mostly maternal or mom, and it's only a few fish species. This is something we really need to emphasize. This is not across the board. So again, two communities in Alaska, I cannot mention their names yet. Um, one is down here. We used hair and diet surveys. As for state of Alaska data that's already been published, many are below concentrations of concern. That's good news. Increasing fish consumption leads to higher mercury, just like in Mexico. Consuming at a higher trophic level means higher mercury in people. That is, they're eating older, larger predatory fish, just like the stellar sea lions. Imagine that. So we can help people have very specific consumption advice by figuring out what is the major pathway of mercury exposure. More importantly, we can say these are the fish you can consume and not have any concern about mercury. Unlimited consumption. That's really the message we should be getting across. So what are the unknowns? We're following up with the NIH proposal with people in Sitka. And uh, we're initiating that study I mentioned in Northwest Alaska. So we will be following up on this. And this is one reason I'm here. Mike Miller and some others said you might be interested in hearing this. So it's a little bit of data on the region. Here we are again across the Aleutian Islands, southeast Alaska, very low mercury and hair concentrations in stellars and harbor seals. So this is relatively good news for you. We would like to get more data. And then we did do a study in Huna where they asked us to examine these uh, elements in the Huna harbor seals. And just want to let you know we have data. Unfortunately, there's been some data made uh, a little too alarmist for another, I don't want to bring it up, but Hawk Inlet, maybe? <laughs> um, so unfortunately, we weren't consulted about what we found in harbor seals from, from Huna. And then um, we have harbor seal data from other places, too. So we can get this data if we work with subsistence users, it's very easy to obtain. We did it in Huna quite easily. So the dilemma is marine animals are healthy, and the consumption is vital to the well-being of many residents in Alaska, but they contain contaminants. And so this is our dilemma. 
So when it comes to subsistence use, I think we need to recognize animals other than fish have to be addressed. Preparation and cooking, I can't emphasize this enough. It very much alters nutrients and contaminants. And, and often studies don't include that. Eating other parts, not just muscle. If you look at many studies, they're just gonna do skeletal muscle. They're gonna do fillets. And uh, I think we all know that many species have other tissues that people enjoy eating. And I've already shown regional differences. Just think about the Aleutian Islands compared to Southeast Alaska, right? So we can't take subsistence use in one region and apply it to another. I really think we need regional specific uh, guidelines and data. So striking a balance, I'm highlighting this because this was native village of Kotzebue. Striking a balance, we did two papers, one on inorganic nutrients and contaminants and another one on organic nutrients and contaminants. The point being, we assess nutrient contaminants in the same tissues and together. So striking a balance. In those same studies, we looked at food processing. We were looking at spotted seal and she fish. Cooking altered nutrient and contaminant concentrations. I've been asking for direct evaluation of actual food items. Hopefully this will get across and we'll begin to sample what's called into the fork. We call this into the fork. Um, that's really where we need to be if we're talking about human exposure. If we're talking about wildlife health, then the raw tissues. We can do both, that's what we did in these studies, we did both. Please recognize people rely on these for nutrients. Dr. James Berner, pediatrician for ANNTHC said if you take these subsistence foods away, I guarantee you an adverse effect. Taking away the nutrients, it'll be more devastating than anything these contaminants can do with the concentrations we're seeing them. Is this getting across? in Southeast Alaska. Is this message being heard? Uh-oh, Chuck kind of shrugged his eyebrows. This is a message we need to get out there that avoiding these nutritious foods will have a detriment. Just, it, sorry to be so frustrated. I, I, I'm a big believer in public health. Taking away nutrients is an adverse effect. So hopefully um, we can do more studies to help with that. Store-bought foods. Contaminants, free alternative, obviously not. So we did uh, fat-loving chemicals up in Barrow. I think we need to repeat the study looking at essential and non-essential elements like mercury. The ones in red are store-bought foods. They're, they're mingled in with all the subsistence use foods. If we did this for elements, I guarantee you there'd be more store-bought foods in the list. You don't need to look at the list. It's just look at the red ones and note that many of them are in the top 20. So they have, they're, they're contaminated. You can't get away from the contaminants. And we put in really rich, lipid-rich beluga and bowhead blubber, ring seal blubber. That you can't get any more lipid-rich than those. So we biased it so that the wildlife would be higher. But there they are, all those store-bought foods. We did an assessment of indigenous communities and their studies for mercury uh, through the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program. I think there's, it's time to apply this down here in southeast Alaska, something like the AMAP model, if you're familiar with it, the Arctic Council. Um, they consider the Arctic, the Aleutian Islands and Anchorage, North Anchorage in the Arctic, oh my gosh. But you guys are not in the Arctic. But I think the principles of what's going on with the Arctic Council apply to Southeast Alaska. Got to end on this. This is why we eat fish. I don't eat fish for this. This is, here you go. Remember sport, culture, subsistence are part of this too. It's not just about the nutrients. This is to show you that the, Nash, uh, the, the, the Marine Mammal Center was very helpful with the harbor seal studies. And we actually got funding from the commercial fishing industry and National Institutes of Health. And then, oh my gosh, when you do stellar sea lion work, the funding and the permits, look at all the funding. 
We're very, we're very grateful to NOAA, State of Alaska, Ocean Peace, which is commercial fishing, NIH. They all helped make these studies possible. And of course, the people that are risking their lives are out there um, doing the sampling. Thank you. How did I do on time, Chuck? You did great. All right. And did I get those? Questions from the audience? Did I get those phrases right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I did the Anupiak, and I got, ended up with twenty ways to say thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Did this as well. Oh, yeah. Here. I'm Reggie Atkinson of the Middle of Canada down for meetings, but I thought I'd drop in and listen. And one important point there, uh, the preparation and cooking may affect that uh, contaminant, the amount of contaminants. How is that so? Yeah, so that's a good question. There, there's some simple things and there's some complicated things. So um, some cooking and drying drives water off. And so when we do raw tissues, it's called wet weight. So in other words, it's with all the moisture in the tissue. When people cook, bake, dry their, their subsistence foods, that drives the, the moisture off, which inherently means you drive the concentration of the contaminant up if it doesn't leave with the water. Does that make sense? So then the other thing that they do in the Great Lakes they recommend is when you bake fish from the Great Lakes, put it on a rack, elevate it above the pan, and let the oils drip out. The fat-loving chemicals will leave with the oil. So then what you eat is got less of those fat-loving chemicals in it, like PCBs, DDT. And so we saw that as, as well. Um, if you allow the oils to leave, some of those contaminants leave with the oil. Um, the thing that was for the organic compounds, nutrients and contaminants, I, I think most of you know this, but a lot of people, the reviewers of the papers, like, are you kidding me? The riskiest thing about organic chemicals was vitamin A. Do you know that vitamin A concentrates in some tissues of some of our wildlife, like in the liver? So the riskiest contaminant was a nutrient. Are you following me? That, so you, you can be... Some of you have heard stories about Arctic explorers who don't know what they're doing and they ate polar bear liver, right? That was vitamin A toxicosis. So what was interesting in that Kotzebue study was vitamin A turned out to be the riskier one. And of course we all laughed because it was a vitamin and not a contaminant. So there are things that uh, can alter the composition of either the water or the contaminant directly. Now, some things will be degraded if they're heated. Uh, we didn't see that with the chemicals we studied because that, that's not of interest to us. Good question. Thank you. Can you uh, mention the other heavy metals or the other, other heavy metals in the, in the tissues of animals? Yes. So, the last major tribal health consortium and our group are now, I can, I can mention it because it's funded and underway, we're doing a caribou project with Kivalina up in northwest 
Alaska. And the concerns there are cadmium and lead in liver and kidney. And so um, some people have been alarmists, and others have said it's not a problem. Red Dog Mine is funding us through the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium to do an assessment of what's going on in those caribou with respect to these elements in those tissues. So that'll be one assessment. And then the other is we're going to give them a biomonitoring program. We're going to set up a biomonitoring program for the hunters. I feel like a lot of these studies, these scientists never enable the communities to make up their own decisions and to empower their own work. So we're going to sit down with them and say, here's the risk assessment, and here's how you get control of your situation, because you can do your own biomonitoring. I guarantee you Red Dog Mine will fund them, because Red Dog Mine's getting sick of this. It's just, <laughs> Caribou have been contaminated with cadmium and lead long before Red Dog Mine shut up. And so that, that would be an example of one. Uh, and cadmium in some marine mammals is in animals that depend on invertebrates, like the bowhead whale, the walrus, uh, bearded seals. We see higher cadmium in some of their tissues because of where they feed in the food web. So yeah, there are other elements in other tissues that um, we address. It's mercury is ubiquitous across Alaska. It's just because of the fish. Um, but yeah, there are other elements we have to study. I had a question about bioaccumulation because I was kind of involved in the response to the Exxon Valdez oil spill and did overseeing a research project. And as you know, Exxon funded a major study to help to develop methods for measuring bioaccumulation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in subsistence foods. And uh, they helped the NOAA lab in Seattle reduce the amount of time needed to do a test. It used to take 10 uh, hours to do a test. And yeah. They got it down to, I don't think, a half hour or 15 minutes or something to do a test for those compounds. But then the issue was not over the lifetime of the creature. It was immediate response to the oil spill. Mm -hmm. So how do you compare those kinds of bioaccumulation? Because you were talking about very long-term. That's right multi-year accumulation, whereas the oil spill, it was like immediate. Yes. So I, I was asked to help with Deepwater Horizon, the Gulf of Mexico spill. And some of the responses that we saw in animals were within minutes. Yeah. So with some of those hydrocarbons from, from oil, you'll see responses in animals within minutes, either behavioral or pathologic or both. So they have a more acute effect. The question there is, it's an acute effect that maybe is reversible. In other words, they get better. Or is an acute effect chronic harm? That's where our job as veterinarians, as pathologists and toxicologists got hard, was we see the immediate response. What, what does that mean down the road from a chronic perspective. And so there's some evidence that they became more vulnerable to infectious disease, for example. But no one could pin that down, because these are dolphins all over the Gulf of Mexico, which, if any of you have ever been there, it's an incredibly filthy place. <laughs> so that, that would be my answer to that, is we know that they cause immediate responses and adverse effects. But, but what of those are reversible and what are not? and cause chronic harm. And by the way, in, in uh, cetaceans, like whales, dolphins, et cetera, it's the blowhole. They cannot get above the surface of the water high enough. So when they break the water, they're right there at the oil layer. Whoosh, they're inhaling all those what we call volatile components. Same for sea turtles. So that we pinned down as the major exposure problem, not the food web. It was, they could not get free of that oil layer, right? They're right at the oil layer. 
And so there's a cloud of volatile oil products, right? They're just, they're inhaling it. Yeah, that was a problem for those guys. So a follow-up question is that you're talking about effects on creatures, but what about effects on humans who consume those? Yeah, Louisiana State University did, yeah, go ahead. Right, so Louisiana State University did an assessment of fish and the hydrocarbons in the fish that people would eat. And because we're so good at metabolizing these hydrocarbons, they determined that it was of low risk. There were hydrocarbons in the fish. The fish could eliminate them, but also we're good at metabolizing many of those hydrocarbons. So they were deemed safe for the most part. What's interesting is these, aer they're called aromatic for a reason, aromatic hydrocarbons, we are very sensitive to sensing. So we can sense them, but that doesn't necessarily make them harmful. But if you can sense them, do you want to eat that fish? I don't. So I would say that that drove people away from consuming the fish was one, knowing it might be there, and then two, they might be able to detect it with smell or taste. We're very good at, um, I think most of you know that, when you're anywhere near a fuel product, even if it's just a little bit of it, you, you can pick it up readily. So I, I think that's the dilemma for us when it comes to that, is that we're very good at sensing it, even though it might be a concentration that may not be a problem. That explains the state epidemiologist's uh, advice given to all the villages, which was, if you can taste it or smell it, don't eat it. Yeah, because we're better at sensing it than... No, there was no other way. No, you... Yeah, that, that's so true. Um, I wish there was a better way to advise people. <laughs> but we can't smell mercury. We can't smell DDT, we can't smell PCBs. So there's a lot of contaminant biotoxins, paralytic shellfish poisoning, we can't smell those. Uh, so there are many chemicals that we're very bad at detecting. And there was a paper out about sea otters being able to detect biotoxins in shellfish. I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's evolution. Now, whether that's true or not, I thought it was inter two interesting papers that I mean, if they're going to eat shellfish, they got to be able to go, oh, no, not that one. <laughs> so I think chemical detection is very species specific. And we're real good at hydrocarbons, but not good at others. Well, thank you very much. I apologize to those in the audience. Oh, you there's, guys a, there's a question online. Oh, there is? Yeah. They, they're wondering. Uh, do you think uh, we'll see effects of Japan releasing the nuclear waste water in um, Fukushima? Marine yeah, Fukushima. So with Fukushima, um, all throughout the Pacific, they've picked up the signal of, of those radioisotopes from that accident. And I met with the state veterinarian a week or two ago and others, and we're able, to, again, it's back to that detection. We can detect it, but it's not raising the levels of these radioactive materials to a point where it's of any issue with respect to safety. So it's one of the things where you need to be careful in what you measure and how you report that. Um, for us, it's not, what was detected is nowhere near a level that we should be concerned about. However, we did talk about bioaccumulation, biomagnification. I would suggest the Japanese do the studies <laughs> to see if those are problems in the tissues people eat. We did something similar in caribou up in the Arctic where we looked at some of the radioisotopes from nuclear weapons testing and, and Project Chariot, if you're aware of that in the Arctic. And fortunately, we saw the radioisotopes, those radioactive materials were decreasing in the tissues at what we call the expected half-life. So every now and then, one should check to make sure things are decreasing the way we think they are. So it's a good question, but 
we're very, very good at our chemistry. And so we've detected it, but it's not of a, a safety concern. I wish the Japanese could find something else to do with it, but I think they've tried. Yeah. He's going to want to give you the microphone. Thank you. The reversal. Of yeah. adverse effects? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is the chance of reversal of the adverse effects of mercury? There are people who are studying that in humans. And what they do with humans is they look at development of children at very specific milestones. So neurodevelopment at this day, based on this test. And I've worked with a lot of pediatricians who, who say it's very sensitive. So they may miss a milestone of development, but maybe in a month or two, they hit the milestone. So by the time they're an adolescent, they may be fine. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's, it's these temporal milestones that we look at. And we do the same thing in the cute little harbor seals. And so some of the harbor seals, they may be delayed in feeding, but they eventually learn how to catch fish. That would be an example of something we saw. So eventually, they were able to catch fish and be fine. So is it an adverse effect to miss a milestone that they eventually achieve? See, that's a, that's a really good question. Is that something we're willing to tolerate? Kids being neurodeveloped one, two, three years later. Is, that's a challenge, right? It's like they eventually reach that capacity, but they're delayed. Now, for a wildlife animal, that is not tolerable. That's survival. I think most of you know a, a, a mom and a pup separated at a very specific time. If that pup hasn't developed and met all its milestones, is it more vulnerable? Absolutely. So I think it's the amount of nurturing that goes on. I'm, I'm getting into too much veterinary medicine here. I'm sorry. But I think you get my point that some seals, they, they nurse for what, a week or two? And they're gone. If that pup hasn't gone through all the nutritional and neurodevelopment, well, then that's a good question. Like, should they have met all their milestones by then? I'm still waiting for my kids to reach some of their milestones, and they're in their 20s. That's, that's a family joke, because they'll probably watch this on YouTube. Um, but I think you get my point, right? That it depends on the species and uh, how important those milestones are be met temporally. So the best study to look at this is in the Seychelles Islands, where they're now looking at the babies they studied way back when. These people are now in their 30s, and they're seeing no permanent effects. And they eat a lot of fish with a lot of mercury down there. And that's a set of islands uh, to the east of Africa. So that's encouraging news. Very good question. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. I think it's been a really informative lecture, and we appreciate it. And it will be on our YouTube soon. And also, I invite people to come back Thursday for another lecture <laughs> on seaweed. Oh, my gosh. By a seaweed scientist. Yeah, I, so I love seaweed. Yeah. Lives, the life of seaweed. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.